Responses. So, what I'm going to talk about is not my book. So, I'm making life a bit difficult for myself, but at the same time, perhaps a bit more interesting for myself, hopefully, a bit more interesting for us all. And just thinking about where we go from the type of critique I make in the architecture of neoliberalism that's primarily directed at the big names in architecture, at the Zahars and the Rems uh, and, and so on. Um, and just as a kind of preamble to introduce you to something, it might, it might be kind of strange that I've become interested in this, but I, I'm kind of interested in more everyday spaces, spaces that we might typically pass through certainly those of us who live in some of the major metropolises of the world. These spaces that we pass through without kind of really reflecting on them, that are not designed especially to be gazed at, to be observed, to be noticed in some way. And yet, precisely at the moment when they do change, we have an opportunity to note 
how they have been before and how they are now and to reflect on what's at stake in the change we're seeing. So just give us something tangible at the start because there'll be some theory before we get to something more tangible again a little later in the lecture. Um, this is an image of a, uh, an underground station in London. It's Tottenham Court Road. And this is the, the underground station for the Architectural Association. That's my connection with it, so it's, it's something I'm very familiar with. Up until uh, around 18 months ago, the entire station was clad in this mosaic, in this tiling that was done in the, I it was the late 60s, early 70s, um, by Eduardo Paolozzi and a number of his assistants. And it's very colorful and bright, as you can see, it owes a lot to, to pop art, to pop culture, there are within it, uh, references to, to popular culture, there are references to what is kind of distinctive or what was historically distinct to this part of London. And what is now, although, although a few of the mosaics have been effectively archived, so they still remain in the station, most of it now looks like this. And I wanted to, so I'm kind of struck by this, I wanted to think about how it is that not just this station and not just the underground stations of London, but so much of our infrastructural transportation systems and beyond those as well, so many of the everyday spaces that we pass through in the metropolis seem kind of indifferent to us being there. They're not concerned to reach out to us and, and speak to us about our culture. They're not apparently concerned to, to reach out and address us as a public. They're not concerned to provide any obvious form of ornament or patterning with which we can identify. And I'm not lamenting this fact. I'm just taking it as an opportunity, almost as a kind of stimulus, to say, OK, well, what, what has changed there? Why is it acceptable to have a space like this that's so drastically different from the, the type of ornament, the type of patterning, which would bring you um, in any kind of infrastructural space, in not only in London, but in the, the Paris Metro, or you can think of Grand Central Station in New York. Um, why the disappearance of the, the reference? Why the disappearance of ornament? Why the disappearance of pattern? With the only, in this case, the only example of any kind of muted um, acknowledgement of the role of art or culture within this space, this kind of super banal frost, kind of pattern, abstract pattern of frosting on the glazing by Daniel Burrow. So Susan Buck Morse, uh, a historian, uh, especially uh, a, a historian interested in the work of Walter Benjamin, has an essay called The City as Dream World and Catastrophe. And she writes in this that from our own post-socialist, post-modern perspective, the dream forms of industrial modernity, capitalist, socialist and fascist all seem part of an earlier historical era. And she writes this in an essay that is itself published in 1995 in the Journal of October. And she's trying, at the end of the Cold War, so this is 1995, think about the Berlin Wall coming down in, in uh, 89. She's trying at the end of the Cold War to locate her own era. 
just taking her, ben her, her, her bearings from this, from Rawls Benjamin's arcade project. So this, this work he does, uh, kind of notorious work, really, of Rawls Benjamin, uh, and an incomplete kind of archival work of uh, trying to understand the 19th century. To paraphrase Benjamin, she writes, for us, over the threshold of the 21st century, the out-of-date ruins of the recent past appear as residues of a dream world. Now, the dream world is, for Benjamin, the manifestation of the historical unconsciousness of the 19th century. So, historical unconsciousness, I think what we can take from that is it's, as I'm suggesting in the title, it, it's about dreaming. So Benjamin takes a Freudian psychoanalytic approach to the 19th century and say, well, not what are individual people dreaming, but what's the dream of that society? What is it it's unconscious? And the unconscious, Benjamin argues, first appears in the arcades of Paris in the iron and glass structures providing cover for the display of the commodity and for its enjoyment. And as a new architectural style, its appearance is anonymous. It's taken up then in other forms that are prototypical of the modern capitalist metropolis. And the experience of this dream world, notably, is immersive and all enveloping. It's an environment that completely surrounds and contains one. Um, and Buck Morse continues, during the Second Empire of Napoleon III, so mid to late 19th century, the cult of commodities burst out of the narrow confines of the original arcades. Iron and glass architecture exploded into a myriad of dream house forms, department stores, cafes, train stations, winter gardens, exhibition halls, sports palaces, wherever the urban crowd congregated. The industrial metropolis became a landscape of techno aesthetics, a dazzling, crowd-pleasing dream world that provided total environments to envelop the crowd. Now, for Benjamin, so he's writing this I'm saying in the 20s and 30s, the dream world that he's writing about in the 19th century, this has already passed into history. It's the world for him of the preceding generation. Yet, however much this dream world was at the surface conscious level, however much it was a manifestation of capitalism, fairly obviously, there is something for him to be redeemed from it, to be redeemed from its form, specifically its dream form. So it is unconscious, uh, it, it's unconscious form. There is a promise for him, a promise of happiness in the arcades. A promise of happiness on the goods on display. In their, in their opulence and abundance, it kind of suggests, in the way that we are still familiar with when we look at advertising, uh, that there's a promise, even though we might know it's a kind of false, empty, hollow promise, it's still trading on the notion that life could be fantastically different and better. So Benjamin's history, the one that he collects in his arcade project, suggests Buck Morse disenchants the industrial dream world of commodities, and yet rescues the utopian desire that it engendered for the purpose of social transformation. This was to have been the goal of Benjamin's fairy tale, she writes. So the fragments that comprise Benjamin's arcade project, she, she continues, evoke a nostalgia for the belief that such a utopia is possible at all. So it's as if she's saying that for Benjamin, he's, he's in the 1930s, for reasons I perhaps don't need to say too much about, but he's 
yeah, German in the 1930s. Um, uh, then that, that's no longer possible. But that notion of thinking, okay, well, maybe we have to work through capitalism to some better future, to some utopia that, that could be at least unconsciously there in the 19th century. It's not even possible in the 1930s. And the, then the next move that Buck Morse does, and this is continuing with the theme of infrastructural spaces, she takes her own example of a dream world. One which is actually contemporary to when Benjamin is writing the Arcades project. And then this is of Stalin's metro system that's designed and built in the 1930s. This is Stalin's metro system in Moscow. She writes, the Moscow metro, a remarkable technological achievement that was an, an immense iconography of power, was the palatial architecture for the working classes. Each station was a total environment, combining, combining architecture, mosaics, and sculpture, thematically designed and aesthetically executed. If you ask the residents of Moscow about their childhood experiences of this extraordinary metro, she continues, they will tell you that it was a magical place comparable to a Disney theme park. And there's no reason why we couldn't think about Disney in the same terms. So for all we might be able to um, talk about the emptiness of its promise, nevertheless, there is some kind of utopian promise still within it. And I think this reference to luxury and the palatial can be seen in other examples as well. Think about just the name Picture Palace, the cinemas of 1920s, the 30s, um, with their luxurious furnishings, their, their chandeliers, giving working class people the kind of recognition that they matter, that they can have at least a taste of luxury. At least there's this suggestion of a, of a promise of something else. Now, you know, I think, however, However much these exemplars of what are the political aesthetics of Stalinism might, for a very good reason, be criticised, what Bart Maltz is trying to do here is trying to offer the same sort of perspective on these as places of enchantment as does uh, Benjamin for the 19th century arcades and department stores and so forth. She says, Pre precisely because these socialist dream houses entered into the utopian fantasy of childhood, they acquired a critical power as memory. This is the moment of disenchantment, of recognizing the dream as dream. But, she continues, but a political awakening demands more. It requires the rescue of the collective desires to which the socialist dream gave expression, the only expression at this stage, before they sink deeper into the unconscious as forgotten. This rescue is the task of the dream's interpretation. So we're, uh, but more too is drawing on um, psychoanalytic models to think about society and how society dreams and what it is capable of dreaming of. So she's writing at the end of the Cold War and she's saying that, that she now struggles to see how this utopian kernel of the enchanted dream world might be rescued. Just as Benjamin's dream world of iron and glass um, as, as to the Moscow Metro, uh, it now appears beyond redemption. The dialectic of enchantment and disenchantment looks to be exhausted, played out in the self-conscious superficiality of the postmodern. Again, remember when she's writing this, mid-90s. She says, Stalin has become eclectic, a melange of neo, post, and retro forms 
that deny responsibility for present history. They reproduce the dream image, but reject the dream. In this cynical time of the end of history, adults know better than to believe in social utopias of any kind, those of production or consumption. Utopian fantasy is quarantined, contained within the boundaries of theme parks and tourist preserves, like some ecologically threatened but nonetheless dangerous zoo animal. Recalling that Benjamin insisted, we must wake up from the world of our parents, Buck Morse asks, but what can be demanded of a new generation if its parents never dream at all? <coughs> now, some 20 odd years since Buck Morse's essay, that effervescence of, of styles that we know as the postmodern has now settled into something more sober, some type of new sobriety, maybe, or a new, new sobriety that defines our contemporary techno aesthetics, our contemporary total environments. And in fact, rather than concerned with the superficial play of the image, <coughs> architecture appears today to have unmasked itself. Its material substance, omnipresent and plainly revealed in a ubiquitous palette of glass, concrete, steel and ETFE lends a certain consistency to projects positioned at the leading edge of capitalist development. Air terminals, shopping malls, urban transit systems, convention centers, enterprise zones, the contemporary equivalents to Benjamin's dream house forms. Structure and style seamlessly unified, architecture appears self-evident transparent, unself-conscious. And if it's difficult to speak of this architecture as a universal language, this is because it seems unconcerned with communication at all. It appears, at least, it appears unburdened of any interest in speaking, unburdened of any obligation to speak, and unburdened of any obligation to speak of Spirit, for example, that um, modernism was, was um, engaged with, has given up on the games as well. It's, it's given up on the games of signification with which the postmodernists were preoccupied. It's rarely spectacular, tending to perform as a continuous backdrop to urban experience rather than drawing overt attention to itself. The common castigation of architecture as spectacle offers, I'm going to argue, limited critical purchase on the relationship between architecture and power as it now stands. However much architectural criticism, and you can all read this and probably do, um, however much architectural criticism remains absorbed with denouncing iconic architecture and star architects, the greater part of the contemporary built environment remains largely anonymous and unspectacular. And this, is, this sits at odds with a critique of spectacle in architecture that's premised, as it is, on denouncing the degeneration of architecture into mere appearance. So in other words, if architecture no longer seems concerned with appearance, if it's somehow, if it's somehow the case that appearance has disappeared, then how relevant, how useful really is it for us to invest all of our critical energies in denouncing architecture as spectacle? Um, spectacle, it still serves architecture with what it imagines to be amongst its sharpest weapons. It's brandished as a term whose mere mention is sufficient to invoke a world rehearsed reflex the castigation of architecture as mere appearance at the service of capital. But rather than enabling us to really think about architecture or appearance, the criticism of spectacle in architecture is more an obstruction to thought and often not always in the... Uh, in the there are people who do kind of really sophisticated critiques of spectacle and then there's everything else that kind of follows on from that, that often ends up in a kind of moralizing, 
and typically self-satisfied condemnation of the commodification and commercialization of the otherwise, of course, always ethically conscientious and humane discipline that is architecture. Now, there are elements of such a critique of spectacle in, in architecture uh, already in existence. We could think of uh, Nadia Lahiji and Ribeiro Andreotti's recent book, The Architecture of Phantasmagoria, where they note that spectacle has become this kind of tired mantra of a supposedly critical posture, lazily reiterating the same complaints against architecture as image, but missing the critical thrust of Guy Debord's writing. Um, and we have Jonathan Crary in his essay, Spectacle, Attention, Counter-Memory, 2001, writing that even then, 2001, spectacle has become a stock phrase in a wide range of critical and not so critical discourses. Now beyond the question of the conceptual exhaustion uh, of spectacle, there are, I think as well, issues of a more fundamental nature concerning its ongoing relevance or otherwise. One of the central issues here being one of whether spectacle has become anachronistic, rendered irrelevant not so much through its overuse, exhaustion, or overfamiliarity, which are all true as well, as by being fundamentally ill-equipped to engage with architecture as an environmental and ubiquitous condition, as opposed to one of discrete and erratic objects of consumption, and of it being inadequate to grasp the significance of an apparently uncommunicative architecture. Another concern is that of the ongoing relevance, or otherwise, of a half-century-old critique originally addressed to the state form of bureaucratic welfare capitalism to its contemporary forms. As Crary asked pointedly at the end of his essay, are we still in the midst of a society that is organized as appearance? Or have we entered a non-spectacular global system arranged primarily around the control and flow of information? I think the latter. So if the goal, the quarry of a critical theory of architecture is to bring to light what is given to us in appearance, to grasp architecture as both the expression and the instrument of a larger productive logic, a mode of production that simultaneously uh, a mode of subjection, as I was talking about in the, the seminar I gave on Monday, then some more adequate means has to be found in order to enable a thinking through of the apparently impervious and self-evident surface of contemporary architecture. The critique of spectacle, which simply notes appearance in order then to immediately condemn it as such, seems ill-equipped for this task. It offers us only the option of averting our eyes and reaching out to our other senses in order to strike uh, a better phenomenolo phenomenological balance somehow. So one of the things that have good typically goes hand in hand with people who use the critique spectacle is to say, oh, the problem is with architecture is it's too geared towards vision, so therefore, the solution to this is that we have phenom supposedly phenomenological architecture inspired by the likes of plasma that says, oh, it should be more about feeling than looking, and it should reach out to our own senses. And uh, many people are enthusiastic about that, not me. So one starting point for this thinking through, so sort of thinking through of, of the experience of architecture, might be to note the blank refusal of a seemingly unmasked architecture to offer up anything for the subject to recognize of itself, of its desires or dreams, its labor or its histories in the phenomenal experience of this architecture. It presents no point of purchase for the psychic, social, or symbolic investment of the human subject. It makes no promises. It offers nothing in the way of conventional ornament 
or symbol, and I'm not nostalgic about ornament or symbol, I'm simply noting what has disappeared and trying to think through why this is the case and what this might mean. In short, this architecture appears indifferent. It's indifferent to its own appearance, indifferent to the subject of architecture. It appears disinterested as appearing as anything other than what itself evidently is. Underwritten by its material self-evidence, architecture approaches what we might call a tautological condition. If this architecture says anything, it just says, what is, is. The significance of this tendency in architecture, in which nothing is recognizable for the subject or of the subject, nothing remembered or prefigured, nothing promised, might be approached by recalling Adorno's critique of tautology, indifference and identity thinking. Um, don't worry if you're not familiar with that. I'm going to give you a demonstration of uh, what he means, hopefully. So Adorno uh, is a, a critical theorist, a contemporary of Walter Benjamin. Um, what he says when he talks about this issue of enchantment and disenchantment um, has something in common with, with what Benjamin says, but also something significantly different. Um, Usually Adorno is, is, is held to be the, the kind of negative, the negative counterpart to the optimistic utopian Benjamin, which is a, a crude characterization, but it has some relevance here, in that Adorno is, is much more kind of pessimistic than uh, Benjamin. And he writes this in his aesthetic theory, um, which is from the, the 60s. He writes, Stenhal's dictum about the promise de bonheur, so the promise of the better life, the promise of good times. Stenhal's dictum about the promise de bonheur says that art thanks existence by accentuating what in existence prefigures utopia. Right, we can, we can, I can keep just saying this for the next half hour and keep thinking about it, but I'll just say it once more. So, art thanks existence by accentuating what in existence prefigures utopia. So like Benjamin is saying, there is some kind of kernel within existence that points to something better, and this is the job of art, is to, is to present this to us. But, says Adorno, this is a diminishing resource, since existence increasingly mirrors only itself. But and I think you'll perhaps understand why I think this quotation is so fantastically relevant to what I'm talking about. Um, that there is no promise of anything else in so many of the, the spaces, the different spaces I'm talking about here. They only, and they increasingly mirror only themselves. Where architecture assumes this tautological, self-mirroring condition, it assumes an expression of identity thinking, the impossibility, that is, of registering difference, difference to what is presented to thought and experience. So it's difficult to think of things being other than they are if your experience is one of, that just says, it is what it is. It doesn't say things used to be like that and now they're better, or things used to be like that and that was better, or they might be like this in the future. How do you feel about that? It just says it is what it is. So the phenomenal condition of self-evident immediacy, it finds a kind of discursive support in recent terms in theory. You may or may not be familiar with, um, certainly they are uh, in places like the Architectural Association uh, and elsewhere. Uh, in the US, for example, certain kind of theoretical terms that have been popular of late, so terms towards theories of affect, so we, we should think of, if not bothering to read, um, think of Sylvia Lavin's Kissing in Architecture. Uh, theories of affect, new materialism, 
vitalism, object-oriented ontology and the like. Um, so we have Fachi Gusavi, for one, who argues that older practices of interpretation are essentially incompatible with contemporary architecture, since this now performs exclusively through affect, so through feeling, essentially, rather than cognition. She writes, though built forms incorporate different material and intellectual contents, these meld together into novel sensory forms which, once created, are what they are. They have no cognitive content in their actuality. So it's, it's something kind of curious here. It's, it's saying that there's nothing to interpret, almost like nothing to see here in architecture, but at the same time using language to tell us this. For Lars Stoibruch, meaning is a horrible word that lets us believe that the mind can trade aesthetics for textual interpretation. In his The Sympathy of Things, Ruskin and the Ecology of Design, he, like Musabi, refuses any cognitive component to aesthetics. Aesthetics, I argue, he writes, is ontology. Things are as they are, aesthetically. Again, that's ontology. It is what it is, things are as they are. Uh, and so there are no special privileges uh, uh, conceded to the subject. Humans, says Feuerbruch, are nothing but things among other things. Matter, he writes, can think perfectly well for itself. Um, I think just in terms of, of the time, I'm not going to go through too many other examples, but just I want to say that this, this writing about, this discourse of self-evidence and immediacy it works in concert with the phenomenal appearance of architecture as self-evident and immediate. They are effectively, so the discourse and the practice are effectively aligned in working to ward off interpretation. The insistence that things are as they are, the tautology of the self-identical supposed to render things impervious to conceptual or speculative thought that will presume to think through their immediate appearance. The notion on which this prohibition on interpretation is built, that objects talk for and about themselves outside of and without need of human cognition, it seems, I mean, I think it's a peer is that it seems to affect a certain kind of humility towards objects, a renunciation of uh, an anthropocentric position that it just very generously allows things to be for themselves and not for us. Um, but this is, of course, a, a kind of performative contradiction, a self-deluding act of ventriloquism, because it's people saying things speak for themselves. More significantly, and in terms of the politics of this, new materialist, vitalist, and object-oriented ontologies are, as the philosopher Andrew Cole has noted, a direct expression of the metaphysics of capitalism. Ours is a time, he writes, when schools of interpretation ask us to personify and caricature objects as autonomous and alive. Is this really the way to think at this moment? For Marx, at least, this way of thinking about objects is what keeps capitalism ticking. To adopt such a philosophy, no questions asked, is fantasy, commodity fetishism in academic form. Again, I don't have time to, and you probably don't want me to give a lecture on commodity fetishism. Um, you can go away and look that up if you're not familiar with the term. But it's really striking the way in which is presented as this wonderful new liberating idea that objects speak for themselves and think for themselves. But this is what Marx says is the hallmark of capitalism and is really bizarre in the mid 19th century. So 170, 180 years ago, Marx is already talking about this phenomenon and, and how it works. So, um, so he says, for example, the form of wood, for instance, is altered by making a table out of it. Yet, for all that, the table continues to be that common, everyday thing, wood. But so soon as it steps forth as a commodity, it's changed into something transcendent. 
it not only stands with its feet on the ground, but in relation to all other commodities, it stands on its head and evolves out of its wooden brain grotesque ideas. So this is the metaphysics of capital. The personification of the object as commodity, so that the relation between products and their producers appear, as he says, as thing-like between people and social between things. Now, fetishism for Marx originates in the social character of labor that it serves to conceal. Right? So it's, unlike the critique of spectacle, Marx is saying, we can see there's a game of appearance being played, and that's the, so we focus on the immediate appearance of things, and through that, we conceal the labor that goes into them, and the relations of, of labor through which they're produced. And I think this critique of the fetish might also open up a, a way to think through the indifferent appearance of much contemporary architecture and the discursive and phenomenal factors warning off its interpretation. What, what we're dealing with here, however, is not so much a fetish of the commodity as a fetishization of matter itself, a fetish of its self-evident immediacy and the productive logic that it conceals, the mode of production lurking behind the fetish of material immediacy today is that of a data-driven automation, captured by and recruited to the in interests of neoliberal capitalism. And what's especially pertinent, though not entirely novel, about contemporary processes of automation is that these are largely disinterested and uninvested in human cognitive capacities. Capitalist processes of automation are no longer, and so, um, you know, automation is not something that um, has just appeared in the last 10 years or so. Uh, capitalist processes of automation are no longer especially invested in appropriating either the muscular or the intellectual power of workers, because the forms in which these forces are required in its current production processes especially those of its large-scale enterprises, repetitive and precise performance of sorting and assembly, logistical operations, information management, network communication, etc., are more cheaply, efficiently, and reliably performed by machines. The production, circulation, and instrumentalization of information in particular and in the type requisite to the functioning of neoliberal systems of accumulation, increasingly excludes the subject from its operation. So what I'm building towards here, this might seem like a kind of very winding theoretical path I'm, I'm going down, but I'm trying to track, I'm kind of track back into this question of why our everyday architecture is uninterested in recognizing us. Computational algorithms, for, in, for instance, as employed in the much cited example of high frequency financial trading, supersede the capacities of the human subject in the tasks of calculating, circulating, and processing the vast quantities of information for which the term big data has come to stand. For some, automation threatens the human subject with a kind of computational reformatting or a neurological mutation. So this is what we can find in the, the arguments of Biff O'Reilly. I, I, I don't agree with him. Because um, I think that this perspective misplaces the subject or kind of misrecognizes the subject as still being at the center of things. So for me, it's not that computation reformats our brains and changes our DNA. It's, it's just not especially interested in us. It's perhaps more terrifying than the notion that we're being somehow out mentally manipulated by these phenomena. So rather than being turned into the mirror image of automation as automata, the human subject becomes peripheral to the productive logic of automation. 
So the issue is that there are now few opportunities, or fewer opportunities, for the human subject, the individual, in other words, to exercise its reasoning faculties within, let alone against, the planning, organization, and orientation of an increasingly automated totality. So, the human subject is outside of, or increasingly outside of this computational loop. Big data is extracted from the subject, the subject is data mined, and what is extracted is information, not knowledge. Or, in another example, that of the, the capture security service, what is captured is the free labor of the human subject in teaching uh, uh, machines to read. So we, we become kind of turned into uh, drone-like subjects um, working for free to train the image recognition capacities of a computerized vision that displaces our own. Data enthusiast and entrepreneur Chris Anderson wrote this uh, often cited essay for Wired in 2007 where he positively uh, appraises this displacement of human knowledge by computational information um, as represented by the operations of Google, tellingly titled The End of Theory. As Bernard Stiegler elaborates, the automated knowledge celebrated by Anderson here no longer needs to be thought. There are many, many takes on smartness, um, machine intelligence, and the like. Um, I'll give you one more take on this, though. Um, Evgeny Muratsov, he talks about smartification. And he says that algorithmic regulation offers us a good old technocratic utopia of politics without politics. Disagreement and conflict under this model are seen as unfortunate byproducts of the analog era to be solved through data collection and not as inevitable results of economic or ideological conflicts. So again, this is something I was talking about in the, the seminar on Monday. It's about when we turn to questions of just efficiency and smooth operation of systems, the political, as it might more conventionally be understood, disappears as a realm in which we can act, but it's still there, kind of embedded within the, the systems themselves. So when we're talking about an automatic society or smartification, it's important to stress that we're not talking about, and I'm not thinking of here, some technological determinism, some rise of the robots. Yeah, every other piece in a newspaper about automation is called rise of the robots. Um, so we're not talking about a rise of the robots, that's missing the point. We're talking about the instrumentalization of technology specifically within and for neoliberal capitalism. So my need saying, my problem is not with technology or with robots. Um, I emphasize neoliberalism because the denigration of human knowledge and its critical capacities have always been central to its ideology. I write about this at greater length in the book, but just suffice to say here that, that human beings were conceived by Friedrich Hayek, chief theorist of neoliberalism, as necessarily ignorant in the face of the complexities of society. Hence, the society and its management should be overseen and directed by some better than human computational process, and that is for neoliberalism to be found in the superior computing powers of the economic market. Now, the increasingly ephemeral appearance of the subject, its alienation from the algorithmic logistics of the world it inhabits, is perhaps equally alarming because 
It overturned certain deep-seated assumptions regarding the relations between humans and technology. Whatever the kind of periodic anxieties about technology, they're by, of course by no means unique to our own time. Whatever these periodic anxieties uh, around encroaching forms of technical, technological, or technocratic rule, these could at least be balanced and were balanced by more benign, progressive, um, and even radical conceptions of technology. So while Marx observes that the human being becomes an appendage to the machine in process of his processes of industrialization, he also fo follows Hegel in conceiving of nature as the inorganic body of man as species animals always being worked upon. Um, and so in that vision, human beings necessarily as human beings always use technology to work upon, in Hegel's terms, to negate the world they find themselves in, in order to produce themselves and their social being. Or we could think of Sigmund Freud in um, Civilization and its Discontents, writing, man has, as it were, become a kind of prosthetic god. Through the civilizing tools now constituting his auxiliary organs, um, Though these might give some cause for discontent, they also make him, they also make man, in Freud's words, magnificent. With every tool, man is perfecting his own organs, whether motor or sensory, or is removing the limits to their functioning. Motor power places gigantic forces at his disposal, which, like his muscles, he can employ in any direction. By means of spectacles, he corrects defects in the lens of his own eye. By means of the telescope, he sees into the far distance. And by means of the microscope, he continues, he overcomes the limits of visibility set by the structure of his retina. We find similar statements from Marshall McLuhan as well, who uh, I think quite famously understands the relationship between the human and the technological, also in these kind of prosthetic terms, as forms of extension through which the human subject reaches out into the world, knows the world better, and is able to act upon that world better. So McLuhan writes, um, any medium, whatever, is an extension, a projection in space or in time of our various senses. And his seminal, uh, Marshall McLuhan's seminal understanding media of 1964 is of course subtitled, The Extensions of Man. Architecture has likewise also been considered an extension of man. In the 19th century, architecture came to be conceived from, uh, principally from an anthropological perspective. Figures as varied as Gottfried Semper, Wallo Le Duc, uh, and then uh, Warburg, understood architecture as an extension of the body as a supplementary apparatus of its care, for its care, protection, and power that was akin to clothing, furniture, or armor. And this conception of architecture continued into the mid-20th century, where it served um, governmental programs of welfare and reform. So it's, it's so kind of blindingly obvious that we don't think about the fact that architecture is you know, what has been up until recently for humans. But now I think especially we need to kind of think about that because it's not always the case. In effecting its own computational turn in recent decades, architecture has effectively shifted its centre of gravity and its perspective from the human subject to the productive logic of a neoliberal and algorithmic governmentality with which its practice is now more effectively than ever assimilated. The architecture considered here might best be conceived then as a kind of protective casing, a sealing off of the operations of automation to which the subject has been rendered peripheral. 
the indifference of architecture, of the outer face it presents to the crowd, is symptomatic of and instrumental to the marginalization of the subject from which the productive logic and organization imperatives of neoliberal capitalism are based. This is an architecture that's under no obligation to promise or remind us of anything beyond what already exists. It no longer serves as an extension of the human subject, nor as a screen for the projection of human dreaming. It's unable to offer, it's unable to offer to, to thought, the thought of things being other than they already are. This is its tautological condition. The appearance of indifference as the lived experience of the built environment educates us through habit in the acceptance of what is for a, a logistics of efficiency, optimization, and security. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, so we're going to have a few people come down to get into uh, basically asking questions and have a sort of uh, brief discussion with Doug before we open out to questions. So sort of in a way to prompt any further questions from Of, of 
tiles or the, the, the ridges in the, in, the, in the corrugation, they all suggest something smooth, well-organized, efficient, optimized. They're not actually doing that, they're just communicating it. Yeah, so there is actually an element of something that's uh, kind of subtly um, communicative in those, in those projects that I'm talking about. Yeah, so that that's there in Hadid's, uh, well, in, in most of Hadid's projects in some sense, but I'm, I've written about that in terms of the central building for BMW in Berlin, or the other example I write about is that of Ravensbourne College in London by architects as well when looking at the way in which the tiles tessellate and that the kind of more or less subtle communication of the way in which um, an organization of the facade might be organized from bottom-up processes but is itself actually designed and designed to speak about that. Our next question, <clears throat> because of the lack of ornamentation um, denotes a blankness of thought, do you think this thought could be searched and would ornamentation be a part of it? Do, do I think that, what could be searched? The, the thought that into. Yeah, um, I think it's, uh, you know, thinking about this, as, as I said, I think in lecture, I'm not kind of lamenting the notion of more conventional ornament. It certainly would be, I think, worth architects thinking about, okay, so do we do some sort of space where people can rec are recognized by that space as uh, being with cognitive capacities rather than just being kind of affectively, emotionally molded. Um, but I'm not, I don't think it's as straightforward as saying if you just have a return to ornament, then all those problems are solved. Because if you have a return to anything now, then you're just looking at kind of, I don't know, second or third generation revival of postmodernism, which I'm certainly not advocating or being favored. In, in a way, I think what I'm saying is that it, it kind of has to be this way because this, this, this is the, like the true reflection or the, the true expression of. Um, the place of the human subject within increasingly automated systems. So they're marginalized, so that's why there's less need to recognize and kind of offer to the subject something to, to recognize. So kind of going off of that, um, and this uh, kind of kind of some questions that I had about um, going off of when you brought in the extension of the person uh, or the extension of the person is in that relationship, yep. as well as this um, dehumanized aesthetic um, and the mass influx that we see and we participate in mass consumption, um, is the value of a dehumanized or a non-ornamental aesthetic um, and the, the, is the result of that then and the accumulation of all of these objects in order to constitute some sort of humanity, do you think? Does that make sense? No, could you say the last bit? So, okay. or does um, the accumulation of these products, so if we keep having to consume and consume, mm. um, is it to represent ourselves and express it, um, the individual because we aren't necessarily seeing that in, in aesthetics around us, in, in environments around us? Maybe, yeah. I mean, I think that one of, one of the things that happens in, if we go right back to the first slide where we've got that, you know, virtually just sort of bare, blank, white tunnel that people are moving through, then it is uh, symptomatic of, as I said, by the, the disappearance of the public, which is also it's a kind of collective representation or a collective recognition. So what happens in those spaces um, is that people insulate themselves. So they will be on their own phones with their own personalized media feed, their own social media, um, their own music. So there is there is individuation in, in that, but it's like it's down to you to kind of customize your own experience. It's, it's really the, the kind of disappearance of uh, a mass ex 
experience or, or collective experience that, that's going on there. Yeah, I mean, basically, we know, you know the design field you're interested in, that the products are more and more about offering you an individual experience or catering to you as an individual rather than seeing you as a member of the masses. Um, so I know the focus was on automation, but do you think also the de dehumanization and indifference in architecture may also be a result or consequence of like an ununified representation of a society or nation? So maybe like would creating a unified orientation be too grand of a mis mission? So um, design kind of goes to that indifference because yeah. that task may be too grand. So, so a good way of putting it, yeah, in that, that it would be too grand because that conception doesn't, speaking general terms, it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, you can have. So where would be the the, the, the place where you would most likely see what the, the German uh, theorist Siegfried Krakauer called the mass ornament? So the opposite of what I've just been talking about, but the sort of thing you see in the Moscow Metro. Where would we see ornament, pattern, decoration that recognizes the people as a mass and uh, gives that kind of grandeur and says something grand about the society? North Korea. Yeah, so that, that's where we see it. We don't live in that sort of world anymore and, you know, by and large good. But what, what we're looking at is the kind of, what is symptomatic of is the disappearance of the idea that you know, the state is somehow, to some extent, the representation of a people or a mass. And, and we're looking in, in neoliberal terms at the fact that then the, the job of the state is just to kind of help the market function efficiently. So it's the disappearance of the political, the disappearance of the kind of grand statement, as you, as, as you say. But, it, but again, it can't just be artificially brought back that would be entirely out of keeping with the reality of, of our existence, of our social, political, and economic existence. And with that, we'll turn things over to a general Q&A for everyone here. Questions? So, hi, um, I want to ask you about the uh, Marxism and capitalism in your okay. talk. So, yeah. I write about communist architecture, and I'm very interested for you to say something about how this applies in a non-capitalist context. So, what I mean is, part of this discussion is about how the market, the state, have have become, you know, the neoliberal conversation about how the, the private has become dominated, dominating over the public. Yeah. So in the communist context, we have architecture that's very much the tautology that you talked about in which the thing is the thing. Yes. And so can you talk a little bit about not Buck Morris's dream world of the Moscow Metro, yeah. but the functionalist technocratic uh, mass production industrialization of the thing in a communist context yeah. in which the market does not operate? Uh, so the short answer is, is, I can't talk about it nearly as much authority as you. Yeah? Um, but I, I suppose it's, what, you, what you're talking about, I understand what you're saying, I think, but this would be analogous to, you know, a non-communist, like a, a welfare um, system of, of social democracy, where, yeah, people are living in, fairly banal spaces, their residences are, are, are banal, where they, their factories they work in are kind of banal and utilitarian and, and functional. That might be kind of more exaggerated, more pronounced in a communist society. But then there's the, the kind of compensatory moment of when you go to the cinema, <coughs> in the case of Moscow, when you go on the, the underground, um, there are these kind of moments still of that, that suggest, well, we're, we're kind of moving in this direction, or even though you live in a kind of uh, kind of functional, um, bare, sparse type of environment, 
when it comes to public space or some other forms of collective space and, and enjoyment, there's a recognition of you as a member of a collective, and that is aggrandized through the, the presence of ornament, through luxury. And so I think, just speaking rather general terms, but one, it's interesting that one could you know, think about the Moscow Metro, but also think about um, America, and think about Grand Central Station, um, or think about Britain, or you know, the, uh, the Parisian Metro, for example. It's all, all offering kind of there's a, an investment in the aesthetics of luxury in those spaces. Yeah, so, so a distinction between the, the kind of everyday and the, and the extraordinary. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so you were talking earlier about how like architecture started going from ornamentation to more simpler architecture, I guess, is kind of individualized the public. And do you think that individual focus that the architecture did led into like this importance of machines and like um, the arch and it feeds into the, like, the architecture for machines. Yeah, I mean, I, this is, what I'm, what I'm kind of at here is, is probably really self-evident from the lecture. There's a lot of kind of theorizing about how we get back to where I started. And then there's still an awful amount of work to do in thinking, OK, well, let's actually get to these spaces and think more about them and, and how they operate. And one of the things I'd like to do is, 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 yeah, so what is the aesthetics of a space that's not used by humans? So what's the aesthetics of a totally automated factory? Does it have aesthetics? Yeah, does it have ornament of some sort? Yeah, so what when you have a totally uh, automated um, plant for growing salad leaves in, in Japan, for example? Or what about the aesthetics of the data center where I target anyone working there? Yeah, so this is what I meant. A, a kind of one way of thinking about what I was saying about the way in which it's kind of blindingly obvious, so much so that we don't think about the fact that architecture is anthropocentric only when we start to get architecture that's not for humans anymore. Architecture is just for machines. And so, yes, I don't have a, like a kind of a worked out answer. That's kind of work, work in progress to think about, you know, the aesthetics of the kind of non-anthropocentric architecture. <laughs> We have time for, I think, maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can project my voice. Very well. <laughs> project away. Um, when we're talking about spaces that there's an indifference to us, mm. um, it makes me think of how, actually, Walter Benjamin, uh, in his essay, Art and Age, Mechanical Reproduction, discusses our embodiment of architecture in terms of either indifference or perception. Um, where the aesthetic reflection uh, is in a different state. Yes. So is it necessarily a damaging thing that these spaces that we move through in indifference kind of invite that indifference? So that when we come out of them, that maybe the contrast is the thing that rehumanizes us and brings us into the world again. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I think that to start with the end of that, that comment, which is, which is great, is, is I suppose the question would be, do we have experiences outside of that? I'm thinking about spaces which I know you won't be familiar with, but if they're especially parts of London, parts of the, the east of London, which have been redeveloped, spaces like Canary, Canary Wharf, financial centres where you can fly into them. The airport will have the same aesthetics, the same materials, the same finishes as the hotel you stay in, as the transport you use to get to the convention center. Um, so the, so uh, in some cases, there isn't an experience outside of that. Yeah? It becomes a continuous environmental experience rather than one of um, like discrete controlled moments and then moments of freedom outside of them. But you're absolutely right that Benjamin, of course, says that the distinctive thing about the experience of architecture, we experience it in a state of distraction. So we're not looking at it, right? But, and I, I'm not kind of suggesting that, well, we as people interested in architecture, we do look at it, 
Um, but I'm not suggesting that most people suddenly start really looking at architecture in that way and noticing the way in which, well, one, one thing, this is another argument against the critique of spectacle as it's used in architecture, because that's all about the notion that we are transfixed by architecture. And I'm interested in what we're not transfixed by, what we kind of don't notice, but might take a moment to notice in order to think about it, to go back to the, the start of my presentation, those moments when something disappears, and then you ask what, what has disappeared and why. Okay, one last question. Hi, uh, I'm particularly Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> I'm particularly fascinated by what you, you just mentioned something about the ways in which um, sort of um, airport architecture sort of resembles like places that you might go yeah. um, as a tourist perhaps or as a visitor. Yeah. And I wonder um, what you can tell me about the ways that architecture is sort of standardized internationally, if that's if that's at all part of your. Um, study and how that affects the way that um, sort of international um, um, discovery tourism, how the way the way that that yeah. impacts. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I mean there is a long-standing kind of critical commentary on globalization as a kind of homogenization and everywhere has the same shots and that. I'm interested in something Perhaps more specifically architectural, which is where you find the same cladding, yeah, the same treatments, the same materials in airports all over the world or in underground stations all over the world. So it's that kind of you know, generic condition that I'm interested in rather than kind of lamenting the it's not so much really actually about the tourist experience, I'm thinking about with the example I was talking about, I was thinking about, you know, a, a, a businessman or woman who it doesn't really matter where they are, whether they're in Frankfurt or London or New York, it's, they're going to be um, experiencing a very kind of, uh, an environment that's really kind of consistent, there's consistency to it throughout. And again, I'm not kind of lamenting that, I'm just trying to understand what, what that might tell us. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Doug. Thank you.